Good afternoon and welcome back everyone for the last session of our day. Uh, it's been a really long and comprehensive day and we're so pleased that so many of you have stuck with us both online and in our small studio audience. Uh, we've really, we're really thrilled to have you all here. So we've looked a little bit about what we're doing in healthcare, we've gone through some of the um, high impact papers and now we're going to have a little glimpse into the future of three strategic programs that we're doing in diversity, in rare disease and in cancer and we're going to end the day with that glimpse into the future and I'm really pleased to invite our first speaker into this final session of the day, Diksha, please introduce yourself. Awesome. Good afternoon everyone, I'm really delighted to be here today. My name is Diksha Shivasava and I'm the implementation lead for the Diverse Data Program here at Genomics England. We're a program that aims to ensure that genomic medicine benefits everyone. So to set the scene, as we know historically, there's been a problem with diversity within medical sciences and research, where predominantly the research is influenced by weird countries. And by that, I don't actually mean weird countries, but rather countries that are characterized as Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. In a world where research and clinical practice is being propelled by data-driven systems, we have to acutely monitor how the solutions that are being built using potentially imbalanced and biased data sets can exacerbate the existing gap in equitable healthcare and research. The COVID-19 pandemic has also been a stark reminder of these pre-existing health inequities. For genomics, this has resulted in misdiagnoses, poor understanding of conditions, and inconsistent delivery of care, as well as mistrust amongst excluded communities on the collection and the use of their genetic data. We're currently in a position where not all clinical insights are being equally as accurate or applicable to every single person. For this reason, the Diverse Data Program was incepted at Genomics England, and we embodied the vision where everyone benefits from genomic healthcare, placing significant emphasis on the everyone bit. Though it's a very complicated and nebulous problem to solve, we here at Genomics England are a passionate group of people keen to move the needle toward an equitable future in genomic healthcare. As we develop skills and tools to address these historical imbalances, we're looking forward to embedding these practices directly to our innovative programs, such as newborns and cancer internally, and work extensively with our external partners so they too can benefit from our findings. As we're in the foundational year of the program, one of the very first exercises we did as a team was explore how our own internal biases impact the way we work. We then magnified the same exercise on a macro level to fully assess how bias fits into our system here at Genomics England, whether it was through the bioinformatics pipeline, the clinical service provision, our engagement strategy, and more, to then be able to identify when it becomes a structural issue. For example, there may be bias in the ways we frame our research questions, the type of data we collect from participants, the goals we set for the program to measure its success, the methods we use to analyze data, and many, many other forms of bias. In order to mitigate this, we then identified four important aims as a program. The first being understanding the data gap. This is all to do with conducting a robust and thorough analysis of our current data set and really identify the gaps that exist with a particular focus on ancestry and how this has impacts on clinical and economic outcomes such as diagnostic accuracy. Secondly, we want to fill the data gap by sequencing high priority cohorts and increase the amount of data we have on those that are underrepresented within the current data sets. So as a starter this year, we formed a partnership with the Born and Bradford Birth Cohort to help enrich the National Genomics Research Library. We want to bridge the data gap by helping develop tools, methodologies, and approaches to ensure researchers and clinicians are better equipped to analyze and utilize more diverse data sets and ensure that their approach to research and clinical practice is as unbiased as possible. And lastly, we want to close the data gap together. Therefore, we're cognizant that this problem is bigger than all of us together, so we want to play a leading role in convening important stakeholders from across the ecosystem, and not only to avoid duplication of work, but also to develop best practice together, knowledge share, and ensure that solutions are being applied consistently. We hope that this collective effort will then raise the bar for everyone within the genomics ecosystem. It's also important to note that all of these aims are underpinned by the brilliant engagement work being done by our comms team who have worked significantly with forming relationships with community groups as well as grassroots organizations to ensure that this conversation is reaching those who are being directly impacted. So why does improving diversity matter? Well, because the eventual outcomes of improving diversity of data will be felt on both sides of the research and clinical care feedback loop, also known as the Genomics England Infinity Loop. Sorry about that. 
This means that by sequencing more diverse cohorts, we can provide better tar targeted diagnostics and personalized medicine for patients, and researchers will also have a stronger understanding of specific needs and use cases and make more accurate references and findings. So that's the diverse data program in a nutshell. We see a future where genomics research and services provision is diverse by design, resulting in equity of access, treatment, and potential innovations. We want to make sure that the solutions that we're developing are at the heart of Genomics England, but also tackle genomic inequities across the broader life sciences sector. So if you have suggestions and are eager to contribute to finding solutions, we welcome your ideas. We're also launching a collection of stories of researchers, funders, patients, and their experiences in tackling data diversity. We would love contributions from the farm community, so please do get in contact if you also have a story to tell. This will be launching next week on mindthegap.health. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Diksha. Uh, it was wonderful uh, to hear about this program, which is new and just forming today. And our participants, the NHS, but also the uh, commercial sector are, are passionate and interested in the diversity issue. And we get a huge amount of inbound questions from pharma about uh, how we're managing the diversity of our data set. So I look forward to hearing more from you and your program uh, in the coming months as it develops. Thank, Thank you, you Diksha. Right, next I'm going to ask our Chief Medical Officer, who you've met a few times today already, Rich Scott, to come and join us on the stage. Um, so we're now going to talk about our newborn program. Come and join us, Rich. Um, we like to be a, sorry about our, our rare disease program. Uh, we like to be uh, a very evidence-based organization, and really the evidence that came out of the 100,000 Genome Project in rare disease has just been crystallized in a major New England Journal of Medicine publication, um, and that has gone on to influence the newborn program, which we'll talk about next. So if I first ask Rich to discuss uh, the paper that just come out, and after that we're going to bring Ellen on stage to have a discussion about newborns together. Over to you, Rich. Thanks, Parker. So uh, thank you for, for joining this session. And uh, as Parker says, uh, we wanted to talk to you about this paper which came out in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, a couple of weeks ago because we think it's a really nice example of how working in our research programs in collaboration with the NHS, embedding those programs in the NHS and having them um, driven by participant engagement and decision making can really uh, make great science happen but also make sure that that science can turn into action in healthcare. And there's a really nice uh, thread through this, um, this um, report, which comes from what we did actually really quite early in the 100,000 Genomes Project. So this um, audience is very familiar with many of these statistics, but they're painful and they think they're worth revisiting and setting the scene. So rare inherited disorders are complex um, there are very many of them, so they're individually rare. Um, we don't know how many there are, but there are six or 7,000, um, we think, uh, as a best estimate. Um, and um, put that together, that means that about 6% of the, the UK population, uh, uh, of the UK population has a rare disease. Um, and that's three, three and a half million people in the UK. Um, I guess one of the Achilles heels, if you like, of rare disease is how many of them are genet genetic in origin or really to sort of turn that on its head, a, you know, so many of them, we can use the power of genomics to try to give better advice to families and patients to think about how we might be able to identify treatments. Uh, and that statistic, I think, of all of those is the best one and the one that we should hang on to the most. Um, it's also worth sort of painting the picture of, um, of where we were 10 or 15 years ago in genomics and in rare disease diagnostics, where I was trained as a clinical geneticist at Great Ormond Street to use great clinical skills to try to identify which very targeted test one should use. That was tricky. Um, biology didn't set itself up to be solved by um, doctors sitting in clinic. Um, and frankly, that approach didn't work. Um, it also used to take a very long time. Um, and so um, the 100,000 Genomes Project, the focus on rare disease was very much addressing that. The, the bit I'm talking about today, this pilot program, was the, the beginning of the rare disease program in the 100,000 Genomes Project, where we, Genomics England, worked with the NHS, NHS England, um, with the NIHR Bioresource, 
and um, centres across the UK which are um, building on the pilot project turned into those 13 genomic medicine centres um, that, uh, that we heard about earlier today. Um, and what it did was begin to look at what, where and how we could be helpful using whole genome sequencing to rare disease families in practice. Um, where we were before was that um, the tools that we could use in the NHS, in even um, using um, research studies, were several steps back of where we wanted to be. As I said, often we were doing very targeted analysis. It was very variable who, um, um, who you, depending on which doctor or which hospital you were seen in, what tests were available. Um, and the, the very best was um, being able to ac access exome sequencing, um, which looks at just the coding part of the genome. Um, and um, even that was only available in a few centers. Uh, but we didn't know what value whole genome sequencing could provide. We didn't know where it provided most value, and we didn't know how to actually embed it in routine healthcare, uh, and how to link routine healthcare to research to really bring that impact we wanted. So what we've learned through um, the data in this study, I think, sort of talks about that, how to apply whole genome sequencing in, in um, day-to-day -day clinical care, um, where, what particular analytical approaches did and didn't work, and, and the data from this program informed not just our analytical approaches, which tools we include in our routine diagnostic pipelines and what data we make available to researchers, but also informed um, decisions that the NHS made about the National Genomic Test Directory. So to give an example of some of the data from, from this study, which looked at those, the first 2,000 families um, in the 100,000 Genomes Project, those, in that pilot part of the program, you can see that we looked, as we did throughout the 100,000 Genomes Project, across a broad swathe of different sorts of condition. And this chart, which just plots diagnostic yield, the beginning of the, of the sort of the success story in terms of ending that diagnostic odyssey, but as we'll come on to, we shouldn't stop there, um, looks at the real, really big differences there are in terms of diagnostic yield in different settings. Um, and um, this, if, if one compares this chart to the National Genomic Test Directory now, it's no surprise that there is a strong correlation. And this, is, this sort of data, this data alone, but also with others, um, drove those decisions. So we can see that, for example, there's real value in whole genome sequencing in neurological, neurodevelopmental disorders, um, also in eye disorders, which have just become um, commissioned uh, via whole genome sequencing in the last six months through the NHS. Um, but we didn't just learn about diagnostic yield. We learned overall uh, that there was a 25% yield through this program. Um, but we also learned some other things. We could see that when we looked back at the data on previous testing um, that people had happened, that, uh, that had had, often the, peop the, peop the patients, um, the families who joined the study had had a lot of genomic testing before they joined the study. So I think two things are no worth noting. First of all, that 25% figure is actually surprisingly high in that context. We could also see, even if we went back through the whole genome data and said, which sorts of variants was it that we would um, discover if we um, used, uh, used the best other technologies, we could see um, that, that, um, that whole genome was bringing really strong added value. We could also see that 14% of the diagnoses in the study were made because of linking diagnostics the, the routine first pass analysis, if you like, to real painstaking research. And that's what went on to develop this paper. So, so researchers with expert knowledge in individual diseases or individual analytical approaches really going that extra mile to find whether it's um, small variants outside coding regions that would otherwise be hard to find, um, whether it's um, uh, or whether it's structural changes, for example, that were hard to f detect um, by other routes. Um, we also, um, although this wasn't the sort of main success story from the study, we did find a small number of novel genes. So there were three uh, genes identified through looking at this study and looking more broadly across the 100,000 genomes data set. Um, but actually, a lot of this is about using the best knowledge that's out there 
um, with the best infrastructure and embed it, embedding it in the NHS. Um, it's also, we could put some numbers on the sorts of diagnostic odyssey, the sorts of journey that families had actually been on in this study. So um, the average time between, and this is looking at some of the longitudinal health data we hold in the research environment on these participants. Um, we could see that there was a period of six years and nearly 70 hospital appointments on average um, before people um, received a diagnosis. Um, and we could, um, and you know, just to sort of imagine that sort of journey for a family, um, I think you know, begins to bring into focus the sort of benefits this sort of approach can bring. Um, this one particular story, I think, really uh, sort of brings that home even um, further. This is a little girl who um, was, the recruitment to the programme was precipitated by one particular intensive care admission with chickenpox, but actually she'd had multiple severe infections throughout life no one knew why. No one even actually, to be honest, considered whole, um, the, that she might have a rare disease for quite some period. Um, uh, we were able to find um, rare variants in um, a CTP synthesis gene, which explained her condition, um, but also, crucially for her and her family, led to a, a bone marrow transplant, which means that she now isn't at risk of, of those same infections. A really powerful story. Um, and the sort of story that we want to make more common, because while again, um, it's really important to celebrate how increasingly there are therapies um, that help um, rare disease families when we do find a diagnosis, that number is way too small. Um, and that's why working not just um, at improving our diagnostic yield, which of course is really important, but also working with the best in science in academia, but and industry and, and many of you here today is exactly what our participants are asking um, us to do um, to make sure that we move from just simply trying to answer questions of why did this happen to having real impact for families. Um, and we're really grateful to you for engaging on that. We're really grateful to Gillian, to the participants panel for pushing us to make sure that we really maintain focus on that rather than sitting back and celebrating the successes of diagnoses. Um, so just to sort of close and bring together the, the strands of, I guess, what, what I think we've, we've seen from this little window on, on some of the research we've done in, in rare disease. As I've said, the data did inform um, the, the um, NHS genomic test directory. It helped us work out where we should be using whole genome sequencing in the NHS. Um, and that, that's happening now live. I, I can sit in clinic um, in the NHS and order whole genome sequencing tests in families who I know will benefit from it. Um, it also shows the value of doing this research in the NHS because you learn the challenges of delivering genomics in embedding research-based genomics in the NHS so we can make it work. Um, and also this paper shows the sort of value that research can add um, to making those diagnoses and hopefully in increasingly improve treatments. Um, and, and also we hope that this sets out a store for what I think we should be really proud of in the UK, that um, government, that healthcare funders um, and um, research funders have recognised is that investment in the infrastructure that can deliver great healthcare, but also making sure that the research is bang alongside it. And in fact, recognising that shared investment at a national scale is how we make um, the progress that we want to make for families. Um, so that's, the, I guess, the sort of the main messages, apart from to say thank you to the participants in the programme who are the, the, the power behind this and the power behind us making sure we ask the right questions of ourselves and the people we're working with. Um, and uh, yeah, happy to take questions. Thank you, Rich. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's really great that you managed to kind of elucidate some of the key findings of that paper. Maybe just do a bit more of a direct plug for the paper itself. How, how can people find uh, this New England Journal paper? So, um, yes, yeah, so it's uh, available online at New England Journal of Medicine. You're probably bored of our Twitter feeds, which have also um, sort of been, been full of it. It's, um, I think one of the things actually that struck me, I guess, being someone on the inside at Genomics England, um, and um, I think it struck a few people was how broad the excitement was about this study. We've, we've actually been using the data 
to work with the NHS to make these to make sure that they're aware and can make the changes for actually some time now and it's I think it's really enjoyable to see other people respond and recognize what impact we can have and also hopefully push others elsewhere across the world but also encourage the engagement and, and people to come um, to talk to us about how we can actually push this the extra mile to make the real impact. Yeah, I agree. So please do read that paper. It's uh, not behind a paywall. It's New England Journal of Medicine. Just search the 100,000 Genome Project, Rare Disease, and you'll find it. Um, and I think it's a, a very readable one. Uh, it's not a particularly technically demanding paper, but it's fascinating. Um, so Richard, if you could just contextualize one of the um, data points you put up there. I mean, you showed that diagnostic yield is somewhere between 25 and 40%, kind of depending on the indication. Uh, for those not so embedded and familiar with rare disease, that might not look like such an impressive number. So m maybe you could just get a, give a bit of context about two things. Number one, you know, w give us a sense of the nature of the complexity uh, of the patients that were coming into this program and why it's so challenging to diagnose these, these uh, patients. And then secondly, maybe you could talk a little bit about what Genomics England are looking to in the future, and we've started already with other modalities to try to squeeze a little bit of extra diagnostic yield out of the undiagnosed patients. Yeah. So, um, and I guess I said a bit about this before in terms of the, you know, and I, I speak from the experience of a doctor trying to help families in this situation. Um, rare diseases are um, complex, they're very variable. The, you look at the range of people who joined our programme, the range of different sorts of conditions. Um, and, uh, you know, biology didn't um, organise itself to be sort of, to, to be impacted positively by medicine. So often these families have been through these terrifically challenging times, often not themselves realising that there was anything complex going on, um, whether it's multiple infections, whether it's a child who's um, not keeping up with the, the milestones that other children in the family have met, uh, whether it's um, you know, being on a renal ward or as an adult developing um, a, rare, a, a cancer or being in a family with a cluster of cancers. Um, these, these families had been through the routine diagnostics that we have available in the NHS, which was already um, one, uh, you know, a healthcare system relatively well set up for genomic testing. Um, in, often um, in that setting, any individual test I might have offered a, a rare disease family might have had a sort of five or 10% yield. There were rare situations where we could be very confident of the condition and zoom in and say, look, here, here, this is where the answer is gonna lie. But it was often very challenging. So on the background of that, taking a sort of 25% sort of leap in terms of diagnostic yield, I think, um, I think it was, you know, is really impressive. Um, I think sometimes, um, you know, and, I, but again, I, I would sort of emphasise that um, I think we too often spend our time being satisfied with big progress because it is impressive, it is great. Um, but one of the things that I recurrently do in clinic and I know clinicians across the country do is sit there and it, you do bring real impact by explaining a diagnosis to families, by explaining what the pattern of inheritance is, helping them make decisions about future family and so on. But actually, the, the change we need to make together with people joining this, um, this meeting a, and elsewhere is to actually stop having that conversation about diagnosis and start having an impact, mm. a, a discussion about impact, yep. um, which is, for example, leading on to what we'll talk about in a minute, exactly where our focus is in newborns. Actually, that's a great segue to the, the, the next question that, I, that has come through that I wanted to ask you as well. Um, so it's been so historically challenging to diagnose a patient uh, that sometimes we forget that what patients really want themselves is a therapy, um, is a cure for their disease. Um, and um, I think historically, many of the orphan diseases have felt quite neglected by the commercial sector because inherently it's a small market size and it's typically a complex biologic required to address this disease. Um, and, um, but we have online today our commercial um, partners from Biotech and Pharma and uh, I can tell you as, as the Chief Commercial Officer that we're getting increasing level of interest from very large companies who have not specialised in rare disease before, actually focusing on orphan, rare and ultra rare diseases. So um, there's a bit of a buzz at the moment, particularly in cell and gene therapy, particularly in the UK where we have a lot of the underlying kind of chemistry skill to build drugs like adosense oligonucleotides and RNAi, RNAi therapies. Maybe you can just um, explain um, from your perspective what, what the excitement's about, uh, how much cause we have to be optimistic. 
So I think I, I, I've really noticed over my time at Genomics England how much more um, excitement there is from industry um, as well as our participants about this. And that's one of the, I've, I've been really encouraged by that. I think it's, it's always, as you say, um, it's historically it's been challenging to get the focus here. Um, I think I think there are now, you know, there are enough examples where this is actually working in real life, in practice, um, that um, families and um, people with rare disease have got real hope for, for, for us to make progress. That doesn't mean it will be simple, um, it, but it, what it does mean is that it, building the sort of infrastructure, the sort of ability and buy-in from families to say, I do want to be recontacted. I want this... I want to be tested um, to understand this condition, and I want um, to know that I can be recontacted if something becomes relevant to me. It's one of the things that people, actually families, um, have worked at the most, and I think it's, um, it's, it's sad historically that they've had to, is, is making sure they stay in touch, forming their own groups so they'll be the ones to hear. And I think the combination of having the infrastructure to be able to do that, to be able to confidently say, we will come back to families if there is this new offer. And by the way, here are the organizations who really want to focus on it and can see the value in it. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And as many of you know, I'm the parent of a child who had a rare disease, actually a rare cancer. And, uh, and so I know the community well, and it is a, a, a proactive community who are very engaged and motivated in, in, um, in finding um, therapies for their children. Uh, but the thing I think that is exciting about what we're building at the moment in the UK, it's, it's not just a science project, it is a national infrastructure, it's a governance structure, it's clinical pathways where at scale we can collect data, we can engage with patients, we can recontact patients. So I think um, if there was ever a time uh, where we can feel optimistic about having a rare disease, um, I think it is now and it's in the UK. And we have further cause for optimism because uh, we recently discovered that, um, uh, that the government have agreed to fund at least the first part of a major newborn sequencing initiative. I'd like to invite Ellen on the stage to discuss that with you, Rich. Thanks, thanks, Parker. Welcome. So, um, people um, who've been watching during the day will have met um, Ellen um, Thomas before. So, Ellen is our clinical director and our director of quality, and like me, a, a rare disease um, clinician in the NHS. So, welcome, Ellen. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we wanted to talk to you about this, the newborns program, where we are um, with it, and talk to you about some of the questions we're engaging in jointly with the NHS uh, and, and with our participants. I'm going to sh start by um, sharing just a, a handful of slides um, about um, the program, about where we are, and about a joint vision um, that we've developed with an NHS steering group that we've, that we've formed over the last um, six or so months, building on um, some work we've been doing for quite some years now. Um, so I shall um, just advance my slides to start here. So um, as I say, we've, we've been thinking about um, those questions about how we get on the front foot with rare disease over the last few years um, to move to really ask the question about how we can bring the benefits of genomics to not just respond when someone has been in the system with symptoms for some years, but to say, what's the, what's the value we can provide if we get ahead of things? And um, recognising that there's a really quite substantial number of conditions that sit outside the nine conditions that are currently um, covered by the newborn um, heel prick in the UK, um, but actually are quite similar in um, their nature in terms of the fact that they are severe, they're early onset, um, there are treatments or interventions that would be available that can substantially alter the um, prognosis. And we think um, there are actually probably some hundreds of these conditions. Um, and there's a real prerogative for us to explore um, how we can um, how we can be more progressive in our thinking here. So um, we've done quite a lot of work over the last few years, um, initially following um, a letter from our chief medical officer in the UK um, to us at Genomics England. We formed a steering group that involved participants, involved patient groups, involved experts in genomics. Um, and that really underpinned quite a lot of the modeling we've work we've done around the potential here. 
Um, then, more recently, over the last year, thanks to funding from um, the UK government to begin to explore these questions, we've done some public engagement work. Um, we've also now formed this NHS steering group, and we're at the stage where we're, we've got a vision for what a programme exploring the potential is. Um, so we recognise that this isn't a simple question. Um, we need to recognise that there are large benefits, so there are also challenges. Um, and just as we went through in the 100,000 Genomes Project, there are lots of practical questions we need to explore here um, with the NHS. Um, and that's why um, we jointly feel that we're at the stage where an ethics-approved research pilot of this is how we'd need to explore, how we need to develop evidence to help us decide um, whether and how um, this is something that is ready for um, actual mainstream diagnostic use. So it's about recognising that this is a research pilot. Um, it's one that um, we be, believe um, passionately that the UK is really well placed to do. Um, I think that's because we've developed not just at Genomics England but nationally a really good way of exploring difficult scientific, ethical, practical questions jointly with the public, jointly with people with rare disease themselves and patients, so that we can have a dialogue with, uh, with those um, groups, but also with experts to develop um, uh, our, our understanding, our joint sort of position on, on um, what is a really interesting and exciting area. But there's lots for us to work through. Um, we also think um, that this is something that's important. We do it at the right pace. We need to do it right. Um, we, this is something which um, we have a real responsibility to do carefully, um, to co-produce with all of those groups. This isn't something which one can just uh, identify a sort of a, 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 a programme plan for and march through. This is about co-developing the questions, the ways we approach it, and recognising we'll learn a lot along the way. Um, and we also think it's really important to be clear about the different questions we're trying to answer, the different areas of exploration. Um, so firstly, that question about early diagnosis, that question about what value could whole genome sequencing bring alongside the Hillprick test to identify those similar sorts of disorders. Um, it's also about recognising that, that we, we should explore how we can develop a platform where, where consenting families and participants can um, ask us to explore with partners like we have today and in academia, where we don't just rest on today's laurels and say this is what we can do, do today, but where we actually ask where can we see the, tr the new treatments for the future? Where can we bring greater benefit in the future? And then thirdly, there are questions around the potential benefit of having a genomic data available um, um, for a, a resource that might be used at other stages in life. For example, a newborn baby um, might be born and six months later present with symptoms and benefit from whole genome analysis um, from a diagnostic perspective. How do we explore that? We think each of those areas needs really careful thought and exploration. We also think um, that those different um, areas will probably proceed at, at different paces, and that's right. Um, and I think that goes back to the real question of we need to do this carefully, we need to do this together with others, um, and we need to do it at the right base and, and be confident to do it like that. So as I said, we've, we're at this stage where um, we've, we've done some early work with an NHS steering group, we've um, done uh, a, a formal public dialogue jointly with the National Screening Committee um, uh, earlier this year. and. Um, I'm sure we can put in the chat a link to um, the findings of that dialogue, which were, um, were broadly positive, but a, a really good first step in terms of engaging on some really interesting questions, and, and there will be plenty of challenging questions with the public. Um, and we, as Parker said, um, the government has indicated that um, they will support us in delivering a programme, um, including um, 100,000 um, babies in this program. Um, we think the start of that program in earnest is probably at least 18 months away and we've got that time to design it together and get it right. Um, and Ellen and I thought we would then sort of just talk, talk 
um, you through a few of the, the areas in which we've been sort of exploring early questions for the programme. Um, I guess the first and um, uh, most sort of uh, immediate front of mind question is about how in that first category, that first question about what other conditions might sit alongside the nine, how do you go about deciding which other conditions we, it might be right to um, uh, look at the genome and, and, and feedback for immediate um, patient benefit? Yes, absolutely. So I think that this is um, that you know, you've, on the slide at the moment you can see the list of people who have been involved um, with us in um, in thinking this through um, to date and are supporting us in the in the ongoing thought process. And I think this is one of the most um, interesting and key questions that we have really started addressing um, with this group um, so far. And um, the. Um, the, the, in terms of thinking about what we're trying to achieve with this project, the selection of which conditions and genes we include in the analysis is really crucial to ensuring that we deliver um, the, the um, goals um, of, this, of this project and particularly that first phase um, of investigating um, what we can do in, the, in, in early life with prediction using, um, using a genome in the newborn um, context. So we've really been thinking with this group about a number of principles that you can use to, um, to, to um, consider um, that how that question um, can, be, can be broken down into sort of manageable bite-sized pieces. Um, so one of the first questions is who are you aiming to help with your genome um, and who is, the, who is the, the targeted recipient of the benefit from that genome and there are a number of different recipients that you could think about in that context, there's the baby themselves, there's, there's their broader family, there's the wider um, healthcare system and society. And we're really, at the moment, um, the early conversations um, on this are that the first steps will be taking a, a, a conservative approach to answering those questions and thinking about, uh, thinking about that. So really the most conservative approach to how we, um, to who is going to benefit from this is thinking about that baby themselves. The baby is the one whose genome is being sequenced and we really need to focus our, 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 our laser gaze on how we benefit that baby from, um, from their genome sequence. So at the moment that's the, the area that we're, that we're really focusing focusing um, our thought um, process on. There's then um, the question of when will that baby benefit because there are many hundreds of conditions which can um, be caused by a genomic change and which can present at very variable times throughout life. Um, and there are um, there are uh, uh, there is an extensive body of um, of uh, research and um, ethical practice in terms of how we use genomic data to predict healthcare problems in the future, and the and the prediction of a problem which might affect a child at the age of 30 or 40 or 50, um, once they've grown up to be an adult, is really a very different context from the context of something which will affect that baby in the very near future. So again, at the conservative end of that thought process is conditions which were, which we know are very likely to affect a baby um, in, in, in very early childhood. And so we're, we're having conversations about, at the moment about conditions that might present in the first um, five years or so um, of life. That in itself is very complex because genes are all very individual and they are very individual in the way that they impact our health. And there are some genes that we understand very well. There are some genes where we can be very clear about the impact of that particular gene and what a change in that particular gene is going to mean for that particular individual. And there are other genes where there's a much wider margin of confidence around our predictions about what that gene will do in that particular individual. And so one of the things that we have to think about is not just which ballpark are we aiming for in terms of when a condition uh, might manifest itself in the child but how confident are we that 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 you know how confident are we that that manifestation will occur in that in that time frame so that is um, one of the one of the tricky questions that we are tackling with our um, expert group um, at the moment so and, and one of the things that we've been doing and we, we really um uh, really grateful to um, people who joined us today to, you know, as with, with all others, is sort of consistently challenge us on how we're thinking, mm -hmm. make sure that we're thinking outside the box here, make sure we're asking the, the right sorts of questions. Um, the, um, one, of the, one of the areas, in fact, that we've um, been dis discussing with our participants, and uh, I think Gillian and Rebecca from our participants panel joined us on a, a really enjoyable early session with um, a group of um, industry partners to begin to tease out some of the questions in that second category, that second part of the vision, 
um, thinking about how we make sure that we're not just thinking about the data and the treatments we have today. What is it that we can think about for the future um, and work through together um, and with those in the NHS um, and more broadly how one might explore those because these none of these things are sort of simple mm. simple questions um, and I think one of the really interesting areas both for where we think about treatments um, in that first group things that are available absolutely today and things that might be available and to develop evidence on tomorrow is that question of confidence mm. around confidence that that treatment actually works and what do people expect um, how much confidence should you have before you even tell someone about the availability of a trial um, and and also and this is a, a really interesting reflection um, a few of us have had during this these discussions is um, our responsibility to develop evidence one of the things that has held back decisions actually generally holds back decisions in healthcare um, um, commissioning um, the, the decisions that payors are making um, the same with screening committees and so on is, is a, just a frustrating lack of evidence and thinking about how we can set up um, with the right um, with, uh, uh, the, the evidence the infrastructure to, to bring the evidence to help make those decisions and in involving families and participants in that just as we have with 100,000 Genomes Project where for example the, the last discussion we just had about the pilot paper the, the power of being able to see the health episodes that these families had actually been through to see where the real benefit was landing is really um, paramount. Mm. Yep. Yes, and thinking, thinking about that, how is the data going to help? How are the results going to help the family? And thinking through that in a very structured way. So what is, what is a treatment? What is a, um, is a trial a treatment? If, if, it's, if it's a randomised trial, for example, and so the child might not get the, might not get the active ingredient, is that, is that, a, is that a treatment? So in, you know, in a, I think this is where the power of this being a research pilot really comes in because you couldn't, um, you, you know, you can, you can, you have the flexibility to incorporate this evidence development process in your thinking when you're when you are carrying out a research um, a pilot of this sort where families will be presented with information about all of these possibilities and they will be able to make their own decision about whether this is something that they feel is is right for their family and their baby um, or not um, is it, I think that will be that will be really powerful and when we talk about treatments for some of these conditions for some of them it's a special diet it's avoiding a particular amino acid in the diet it's so if it's not it's not always um, you know there's a full range of of ways in which this kind of information can impact on, um, on, on babies and it can be anything from something relatively straightforward through to um, a you know, brand new gene therapy trial which um, of the sort that we've seen um, you know very excitingly coming coming through the, uh, the through in to the NHS in, in recent years. So we are getting a lot of questions coming through can I ask you some questions from our, our uh, online audience uh, so the first one very good question uh, this is such a delicate and sensitive topic how are we making sure that we're doing the right thing for the public? Quick answers because we've got loads. Um, so I think the, the main thing is to ha to um, involve the public and actually one of the words that we've used most um, in this is a conversation and a dialogue um, because um, we need to share and, and actually you know hear from from people broadly um, what those questions are. So we we think being very forthright about this and and being clear both on our insistence that we do this right and at the right pace but also most crucially with others and with the consent of people who are going to be joining this program. So can you tell us what we did do with the public dialogues? So the public dialogue um, is just the beginning of this but earlier this year we worked with National Screening Committee and with ScienceWise and with 130 members of the public um, from across the UK, um, different parts of the UK, um, not just um, England but um, in the devolved nations as well and also people from different backgrounds so families who were just expecting a baby, um, people from different communities so that we got um, input relatively broadly and that was the if you like the first step in this where we had really uh, encouraging and positive noises in terms of people's enthusiasm we also very clearly um, heard the message of we need to do this right and we also know that there are lots of other 
that there are lots of questions that in time and in sequence we will be working through in similar sorts of formats yeah. to make sure that this is you know it's an ongoing dialogue so we need also the question of pace um, comes really comes in here is is that this this pilot project will start um, to by targeting very specific questions that are the ones which most fit in within the comfort zones of that of that di ongoing dialogue and then but then it does have the potential for this to be the, the first step and for that and for the next steps to build out in various different directions but only at the speed um, with which um, with which the di ongoing dialogue and engagement demonstrates that there is that public comfort so there are many different directions that you could take this data set in there are many different directions there are different other questions that you could target at the data but only with the um, with the blessing of the participants who take part in it and with the, with the and of the wider public well that's a good segue to my next question uh, so the, the participants will all have given their blessing through consent and the next question relates to that uh, uh, relates to the research consent so how can we make sure that this is not just a diagnostic exercise but that it also creates research opportunities that deliver treatment options uh, and I might just add an, an, an extra question what data are we actually going to be making available for research so we're, we're in the process of, of does, you know working through what the best approach is and, and I think that that sort of very clear delineation that there are separate questions here and if you like question number one is about about um, immediate diagnostics and, and treatment from, um, with treatments we have available today. And the second one is about exactly this question. Um, at the moment, we're, we're actually, we're re really interested to hear, to work with um, families, the NHS, but also people who could potentially be um, um, using, you know, working with us on this program from a research point of view. So what um, sample types um, will make sure that we can answer questions um, that, that are really pressing, um, but also um, what other sorts of longitudinal data, etc. So we know that the public um, for the, in a, the rare disease diagnostic setting are happy with the Genomics England research offer. We expect that a, a similar approach is one that would be taken yeah. um, uh, here. Actually, this is a question I get quite often myself. I'd love to hear your response. So. Um, are we going to allow parents to take the data and send it to analysis by different companies in healthcare systems? Do you want me to answer that? Yeah. yeah um, so the answer is yeah, this isn't um, this is the family's data. It's the um, the person whose genome is his data, um, not our data. So it's something that um, that we do support. In reality, um, and through our experience in the Hundred Thousand Genomes project, people very rarely actually want to do that. What they want to do is know that the that their data is being used for what they want and to the right ends. And most of the time when families approached us or their clinicians about that in 100,000 Genomes Project, it ended up being that actually they, were, they wanted the data to be used in, in the Genomics England yeah. environment and by the NHS. Agreed. So here's a good hairy ethical one. So um, uh, this is really about um, if we discover um, a potential health risk but which does not impact children in the first five to ten years but is likely to be penetrant later in life and yep. affect them later in life um, how are we going to manage this this situation where we're not going to report that result yet but it may become very relevant and very important later in life. Yeah, absolutely. So this is um, this is a really important question, and it turns a lot both on the nature of genetic analysis and the nature of conversations about consent. So um, the p people who take part in this will be prepared will be prepared for you know when when we've been through this co-design process, there will be a set of materials which makes it clear to people what they will be what they will be getting back and what they won't be getting back from the project, and then we will stick to that. And um, the, that doesn't mean that that is the only thing that they will get back, but it means that means that they wouldn't get things back outside that without another conversation. So people will know, whether, you know what is within the offer at the point um, when they sign up. And I think this is the really important thing here is that a, a raw genome doesn't answer any questions at all. So just generating a genome sequence doesn't generate any predictive information until you target questions at it using an analysis. And the, the idea of the principles that I was talking about earlier about how we think about whom, um, how we target those questions is that we only target those questions. So for example, we know that we can tell from a genome if we ask the genome, does this person have the change in the Huntington's disease gene, which means that they will develop Huntington's, we can answer that question. But if we don't target that question at that genome, that, that evidence is never generated. It's as if you hadn't had your genome sequence. The, the, the data doesn't exist. The answer isn't there. And so it's not that we are generating information that we're withholding from people. It is that we are 
telling people what we will what we what questions we will be targeting we will target those questions and then we will stop and things the the uh, obviously broader analyses happen in the research context in, under our current research model but those are de-identified analyses and things do not pass back through the re-identification process outside a very clear set of parameters and that is one of the things that um, is absolutely core to the um, the ethos of genomics england and all of our partners and the way we work so um it sounds like the theme of this conference, really, from access to insight. But we mm. should say that all of the data will be captured uh, in the research environment, and if discoveries are made later on yep. uh, about that genome, then we already have an established process of diagnostic discovery yep. where researchers globally can uh, reach out to us, yep. propose a potential diagnosis due to a kind of functional characterization of a gene or a variant, and then we will review that ethically and review the accuracy, and we may make a decision to report that back to the clinician. Yes, and that's the benefit of having a framework rather than a... So because within a framework if you say that the things that we will return to people are things that meet these criteria over time more things will meet those criteria so we may very well be able to go back and provide more information because a treatment has become available or because um, because the, the, because a change has happened in our understanding which has allowed us to reanalyze the data so you've been very clear about um, being highly focused and aren't asking very specific questions and starting slow um, Nevertheless, I've got this question, which is a good one as well, which is uh, beyond the diagnosis of the patient in front of you, there may be other benefits, for example, pharmacogenomic insights uh, that could impact that patient later in life, and even germline insights into that child's parents that may be useful to young parents who are going on to kind of yeah. high-risk uh, um, phases of their life. Um, do you think we have scope uh, to integrate those findings into clinical care and are we considering working with primary care to, in, to introduce genetic insights into someone's general health record? Yes, so they, those are definitely um, part of the framework and the conversation that is happening. Um, at this preliminary stage, it seems less likely that that will be the, the question that we target straight away at the data because of the broader implications of that data and the broader ethical and societal questions that those raise. So they, um, we are still co-designing this programme and we don't know exactly where the, um, where the thresholds will lie, but our, our anticipation at this stage is that those would be beyond the threshold of the initial programme, but that, um, that, but that they are fascinating questions to um, unravel over time um, in combination with um, stakeholders who can help, to, um, to help, help us to come up with proposals as to how we might um, tackle those in, over, over the years. Uh, and another thing to say on that is that um, the, this newborns programme is one of the programmes that, that we're working on actually answering some of those questions. Newborns are the last group you'd start with answering about people who are much older. For example, 100,000 Genomes Project participants um, did um, uh, sign up where they chose to, to receive some very carefully selected findings that are relevant um, in, um, to, um, for example, um, adult cancer risk, um, where there can be an action taken on that. People had the choice, they knew what they were signing up to. In fact, before we did the analysis, we went back and checked that they stood by their choice. Yes. Um, and so actually, it's about developing sort of an understanding across how we use genomics, with the newborns programme being very well placed to answer some questions, and actually us needing to recognise that We'll, we'll learn a lot from working with participants at different ages and different programmes. Okay, and um, I, I think I have a final question, which is, uh, I think, very important that we um, present clarity on. So the question is, uh, you've talked a lot about newborn. Uh, can you confirm that we're focusing on newborn babies, not uh, prenatal um, and not pre-implantation? Absolutely, yes. So that, and that's one of the things that we actually say in so many words in our, our, the sort of vision document that we've, um, that we've um, jointly generated with our NHS steering group. This is about exploring the value after a baby is born um, with, um, with those samples taken after the baby is born and about the benefit in the newborn. So it does what it says on the tin, newborn yep. sequencing. Okay, thank you very much. So I think you heard from um, this team who are extremely experienced, not just in research, but in the clinic, that we're taking a very slow and careful and measured approach to this. But don't, don't let that um, uh, fool you about our underlying excitement about being the, potentially the first country in the world to, with consent, whole genome sequence or newborn babies. We're making major strides to launch an enormous pilot to make that happen. So um, we're, we're all thrilled about this here and we can't wait to get started. Uh, thank you very much thank to you. both of you. And we're now onto the final panel of our day, uh, which is a cancer panel. Uh, and I'd like to invite uh, our three speakers onto the stage.
Um, and whilst uh, they're joining, uh, let's talk a little bit about cancer. So you may have heard the words of Siddhartha Mukherjee, which is the name of his book, which is that cancer is the emperor of all maladies. And why did he call that? It's because cancer is such an extraordinarily complex disease. Cancer is multigenic. It's um, metastatic. Um, it is um, heterogeneous and not just intertumorally, but intratumorally. And that heterogeneity is not random. Sadly, it's driven by treatment effects, which drive clonality that, that, go, that then go on to lead to further suffering of the patient. Uh, there's somatic interaction with germline. There's somatic interaction with the immune system. There, there's somatic interaction with the viral world, with viruses like HPV. There even appear, appears to be kind of immunomodulation from the bacterial world with the biome. So it is an kind of exquisitely complex disease. Um, so we focus very much on DNA. Um, and in the future of our, our cancer program, we're going to be going deeper into DNA by looking at, at uh, long read and methylation sequencing. Uh, through Oxford Nanopore, their Nanopore sequencing program. And we're also going to be looking more broadly by adding other modalities which will introduce the spatial context into cancer, so uh, digital pathology and radiology, and introducing that in the context of our genomic and also our clinical data. So I'm really pleased to have on stage some absolute world experts. We have uh, Danny from Oxford Nanopore. I'll ask you to introduce yourself fully in a second. We have Greg, who runs our, our sequencing lab uh, at Genomics England, is an expert in both short and long reads, and we have uh, Professor Lewis Jones, uh, who's a breast cancer pathologist, uh, who works uh, four days a week in Bart's Hospital, uh, is a, a renowned researcher, and also works one day a week uh, with Genomics England, supporting our uh, genomic program, and has done for many years. So we're really pleased to have you on the stage. Thank you for joining us. Um, so can, can I just ask you, uh, Danny and Greg, to introduce yourselves properly? Yep, so I'm Danny Folkard. Um, I'm the Senior Strategic Account Manager in the UK and Ireland for Oxford Nanopore Technologies. So I've been at Nanopore for around two and a half years now, so the technology has developed significantly over that time. Um, working with the high throughput um, sequencing accounts within the UK. Yeah, okay, great. And Greg? Hello, I'm Director of Sequencing R&D at Genomics England. Uh, and my main remit is to coordinate the activities of uh, R&D Lab, which is based at the Wellcome Trust Genome Campus, and also to assess primarily whole genome sequencing technologies, but really any genomic te technologies that look like they're moving to a phase of maturity where they could be adopted in the clinical uh, space. So one of those technologies is uh, Oxford Nanopore, and we're um, addressing that technology to cancer. Maybe you could just describe briefly what our long read program is. Yeah, so uh, in the lab at Hinkston, we, we've actually been uh, working with Oxford Nanopore for some time now. We took on board their whole genome sequencing instrument, the Promethion, a couple of years ago. And we've seen that go through uh, a series of um, major upticks in development and uh, throughput over the last couple of years. And we've been very excited about exploring cancer in more detail because cancer really is a disease of the genome. As you explained, Parker, it's very complex. It doesn't just feature single point mutations or even just driver mutations, there are whole sets of features of the genome that are associated with cancer. That includes methylation, which is one key point that we'll probably talk about in a bit, but also it covers other areas of the genome and other types of variant that are really quite difficult to unravel. And we at Genomics England really have whole genome sequencing at our core, and we have used the, the, the exquisite accuracy of Illumina technology for many years, and that's what drove our 100K project, and that's been very successful. But there are certain aspects of the genome that are really recalcitrant to Illumina analysis, and, and they're areas that we'd like to complement with other technologies, and, and long read technologies and nanopore technologies certainly fit that bill. So that, that's why we've been really focusing on that. The, the cancer program is, is funded by the Department of Health as part of our spending review last year. And we are looking at the moment to really test drive right to the limits um, the technology, so really to push 
uh, the number of genomes we can, we can sequence using that kind of technology um, and optimise what we can get back from those, that sequencing output. And that's the core of our technology at the moment. We're, we're trying to look at a series of cancers that we have talked to uh, NHSE about and, and we and NHSE have agreed they are priority areas. Um, uh, they cover the uh, hematological malignancies, they also cover sarcomas, uh, paediatric and brain. And, and they're key areas, they, they all have um, really, really great reasons. I mean, every cancer has a great reason, but the, the, at the moment they're ones that have been bought into GMS for short read sequencing. And so we're, we're capitalising on that and we're trying to build evidence to show that long read will add value to that. Thanks, Greg. OK, so Danny, what is nanopore sequencing? See, if you could do your very best in, in a couple of minutes to explain yeah. how it works. Fantastic. So at the heart of Oxford nanopore te technology, we use nanopores, arrays of them embedded in a membrane. They're tiny proteins that have a hole that allows for a piece of DNA, RNA, um, whether it's short, long, really, really long, um, to pass through these protein nanopores. And as they do, they change the signal as a, as a current passes over the membrane. And from that signal, you can interpret the sequence of the genome, uh, the genetic material that's passing through. So our chemistry allows us to control how fast that happens. And as the, the molecule moves through that nanopore and the signal is disrupted, that signal can be interpreted in real time. So this adds a different angle to, to nanopore sequencing in that that data is generated in real time that allows for faster turnaround times potentially. Um, and so in terms of the native nature of, of sequencing DNA in its native form, it doesn't, those regions of the genome that are difficult to interrogate potentially with, with other technologies don't pose the same problem. So you can reach areas of the genome that you haven't been able to before. And that signal, raw signal file ha, is, is information rich. You're able to look at small variants, those large structural rearrangements that are predominantly you know, seen within in complex cancer genomes, and also the modifications of those bases. So Greg mentioned methylation, and inherently, as that native molecule passes through the nanopore, within that signal, an unmodified base is going to look very different to a modified base. And so as long as it's, that, that looks different, that can be interpreted by an algorithm that will say, this is a methylated C. And without doing anything else to your DNA material, you've essentially now got yourself a comprehensive data set that's looking at both the genomic and epigenomic changes that are present within that genome. Okay, so it is literally like a, a pushing a, a thread through the eye of a needle. And, and thousands of needles at the same time. Thousands of needles at the same, same time. Remarkable uh, that it actually works in practice. Um, Greg, you recently sent me uh, a paper that I had to read about five times. I think it was called Telomere to Telomere, and it really explained that we do finally actually now have a whole genome, something that I think many people yeah. thought we've had for a while, but in fact there are telomeres and centromere sections that had never been sequenced before, and we've now, we've now got it. So can you just tell us, you know, what does that actually mean for patients and what does it mean from a clinical interpretation perspective uh, in the lab? Because this, is, this sure. is kind of the Wild West now. Well, if you're going to have a reference genome, you want that reference genome to be complete. You want to have every gene in it and you also want to have all the other regions that may be affected through genome instability, for, for example, the telomeres, the centromeres. And the telomere to telomere consortium uses a whole combination of, of sequencing technologies. They use short read, but they use a lot of long read technology as well to develop um, a real, um, as it says, telomere to telomere, all the chromosomes except for Y, um, to uh, generate a complete reference genome. Now, that's not fully annotated yet, and an annotation of genomes on an industrial scale takes a long time, but ultimately the annotations will be lifted across to it. But there are additional genes in there. There's over 100 additional genes, but there are also some repetitive regions, as I say, that may be associated with instabilities um, and are always prone to um, deletions or, or uh, duplications. So they, they could be instrumental in, in a, a disease mechanism. And so to have that full reference is, is key. Um, and what we would ultimately like to do is be able to use the nanopore genomes we generate and, and map those to a, a full reference because that will give us a much clearer picture of the whole genome. It will enrich the kinds of data that we can extract from that genome. And, and ultimately for the patient, we want to give them the full picture. You know, we can give them a, a beautiful precision black and white picture at the moment through Illumina sequencing, but if we want the full color 
job, then we, we need other technologies. And, and to my, my, you know, the, the way I look at this is that we, at the moment, we could use short read and long read together to produce a really, really full picture of the genome. Yeah, I think that, that sounds uh, very reasonable um, future. And it's 8%, by the way, that we're missing. Yeah, 8%. And that's, that's a reasonable chunk of the genome that's not in the reference. And, and that could have been an entirely non-coding part of the genome, but it turns out, as you just said, there are 100 new genes discovered that really the, in the last year. So it's remarkable. And we mustn't underestimate the non-coding portion of the genome. Yeah. Uh, so, Louise, I'm going to hand over to you very soon to, to flip the conversation towards pathology, but just one last question to you and uh, to, to Danny and Greg really about, um, and, and more focus on our, our um, biopharma audience here. So, um, there are many new features of the genome, but also the chem chemical modifiers of that genome that we're going to discover and um, find associations between that and um, hopefully causative effects and drivers of cancer. Um, what do you think that the drug discovery world should be excited about uh, with respect to these new features? What should they be keeping their eye on? Because this data will soon be available to um, our research community through our research environment. So I mean, you mentioned the telomeres and the centromeres, right? These are regions of the genome that have never been have seen before. So looking in the, the dark regions of the genome to, to identify if there's targets there um, of interest. But it is those structural variants and the epigenetic modifications that the evidence base is being created by you at, G at Genomics England with these, data, with these samples. Building out that data set to be able to interrogate different modifications, different variants that haven't got an evidence base right now. Um, and then being able to take those further and, and see the impact and, you know, whether these are driving, you know, having effects on, on the cancer and whether it's on treatment response, on resistance and things like that. So I think it's, it's reaching the parts that you haven't seen before and being able to interpret variants that right now don't have a, a solid evidence base for. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Anything you want to add to that, Greg? Uh, I, I would just add, I think that's really true. We, 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 we kind of open up the, the range of mechanisms and the ranges of uh, ways of which we look at we, how we might control or, or treat cancer, but it also gives us the opportunity to understand, understand the progression of cancer. You know, we, we, don't, we look at that in a very one-dimensional way in terms of the evolution of the genome because we we've, haven't we've had the tools to look at it in other ways. But, you know, differential methylation is a really... Um, key feature of, of uh, many cancer genomes, but it's also a key feature of how uh, gene expression is controlled. So if, if we start to understand how we can modify that or, or you know, target that, that that's a, a huge potential plus. I mean, it, it, it really underpins the fact that at Genomics England, we, want, we have this kind of dual model where we want to provide the data to basic researchers because some of these questions are really basic research questions and, yeah. and you know, we're not going to find an answer tomorrow, but some of them are things where you know, there's already stuff out there probably that we need to link in with the data that we generate and, and hopefully the, that allows <coughs> more commercial entities, pharma, et cetera, to capitalise on those. Yeah, I agree with you. So, and not only just markers for, uh, for monitoring disease progression, but yeah. also markers for... Um, for, for doing surveillance for um, um, patients in remission uh, against potential relapse. So there's, there's, there's lots of markers that are going to be important, I think, beyond just response to treatment. So, um, Louise, let's flip, flip the conversation to what we're doing really in the more kind of spatial context uh, of, of cancer. And uh, I'm just going to start by very briefly summarising um, our multimodal programme. We're sometimes calling it the radio genomic programme. Um, so we were recently uh, given funding, actually it was about a year ago now, we were uh, given funding by, um, by the Department of Health to fund a multimodal program in our solid tumour cancer data set. So we have just about 16,000 solid tumour patients within our, our cancer data set. And for all of those patients, we're going to be adding h &E digital pathology and then as a second priority, radiology to all of those, those um, cancer genomes. Um, and importantly, we're not just adding the index slide, the index H&E slide, we're going to be looking at the entire incision block, so that may be up to 25 slides per tumour, and there could be multiple tumours for patients. So uh, this is a, a really kind of comprehensive exercise of gathering uh, these slides, uh, many of which are digitised already, but some that need to be digitised. We're working with our partner in Leeds, Darren Trina, and his NPIC consortium, uh, who will be doing the, the imaging, the, the physical photography for us. Um, and just so that people understand, um, 
um, how this works. Um, we are getting the contiguous image that was done at the same time as the whole genome sequence. So when the sample is taken from surgery, it splits, some of it goes into fixed form and down a, uh, um, an H&E and an immunohistochemistry pathway, and the other, the other part of the tumor goes fresh frozen into our uh, genomic um, bioinformatic pipelines. Um, and so we're bringing those two uh, contexts together in, in what we hope will be really one of the most enriched research environments in the world alongside the clinical data. So that's the program. Um, and uh, Louise, m maybe you could just first start by talking about how has digital pathology really influenced life um, as a practicing uh, pathologist in clinic, but also as a researcher? So I think, well, finally, pathology and pathologists are moving into the 21st century. Um, it's taken a while, a bit slow, but we are getting there. So um, there are pathology departments that are entirely digitized now. Uh, virtually every department in the country has a program and a plan to become digital. And I guess in the clinical setting, the reason for um, digitization is essentially efficiency and flexibility. So we spend vast amounts of man hours shifting glass slides around. We send them around the country. We lose them when you have to get them recut. It's, it's you know, it's, um, it's ridiculous, really. You wouldn't invent it if you started again. Uh, however, I think that, and I think that this will be incredibly important. I think the ability to ask somebody at the other end of the country to look at the case you're looking at in real time and converse with you is, is amazing and will change the way we practice. Uh, but I think it's only actually scratching the surface. I think that there is a huge potential for digital pathology and the way that it will change how we work. And so, sorry, I could talk forever about this because you know, I'm a pathologist. I think it's really important, right? But we actually only report a very small amount of what we see on a slide. So, you know, I report lots and lots of breast cancers and my report will say, grade two, estrogen receptor positive, invasive ductal carcinoma. That's all the clinicians want to know. But actually, no two single grade two ER positive infiltrating ductal carcinomas look the same. And sometimes, you know, we're creatures of um, gut reactions pathologists. We think, I don't like that stroma. Ooh, I don't like that immune infiltrate. But we don't report it to anybody. We don't tell anybody. And I think, I think that that's probably really important information that is just untapped. So I really believe it's going to change the amount of information we exploit from the tissue we look at in the future. That's great news. And it seems that the NHS is really backing this uh, effort to digitise, correct? Yeah. yeah, totally. Pleased to hear that. Um, can you just make any comments about the unique, uniqueness of this data set that we are building today? We, just so people know, we have about 35,000 uh, H&E images in the data set today. We hope to have about 200,000 by next summer. So, that, so we, you know, we're, we're just starting off. Uh, but I know you'll be familiar with TGCA and other data sets out there. How, how do you think this will compare? So I think there are a couple of things that are quite unique about this, and I find it very exciting. I mean, yes, other data sets have brought H&E images together with genomic information. Uh, you alluded to the fact, Parker, at the beginning, that we're not just going to look at a single H&E image. We're going to look at whole cases or near whole cases. Now, that's really important because actually there's information in non-tumor tissue that might be very relevant to how a tumor behaves. And that's something that certainly doesn't exist in other programs. Also, that, that multimodality with imaging. Um, and I think something that is absolutely unique, in my view, to our data set is the longitudinal data and information that we get. So it's clearly important um, what is happening to the patient at the time of surgery. How big is their tumour? Has it already spread to lymph nodes? Have they had any therapy and responded? But actually what's really important is what happens to them in the rest of their life. Um, and as, as the database matures, actually it's going to become more and more valuable because we'll be able to start predicting who is going to recur later, who is going to be cured of their cancer with you know, radiotherapy and chemotherapy, and who is going to recur despite all of that apparently having had the same type of tumour. So I think it is unique in, in those aspects, and that makes it really, really exciting. 
with that. So we're, we're, I think we can we can hear the excitement. So I mean, it's not just our strong intuition that the spatial context is relevant to cancer biology. Maybe you could just kind of ground that in some you know real examples of, of real cancers that you've looked at where there is a kind of microenvironment impact on response to treatment, for example. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, as I said, we report a tiny bit of what we see, but. We know there's a vast body of research, and many people here will be aware of this, about the interaction between tumour cells and the host microenvironment. And the tumour cells influence the host microenvironment, but of course the host microenvironment will influence the tumour cells as well. We capture none of that, and actually, you know, the whole genome sequence will be mainly capturing alterations, of course, within the neoplastic cells. But we want to know how that interacts with the rest of the microenvironment. Uh, we know, for example, that um, you know you can harness the immune microenvironment through immune checkpoint inhibitors, but we don't actually have terribly good predictive markers for who will respond and who will not. So these are all things that we can explore with outcome data as well. You know, in response to the treatment. So there's a lot, there's a lot to be done. And of course, now we have machine learning. Um, people are increasingly trying to uh, retrieve from H&E images and, and other markers um, information that we cannot quantitate as, as human beings. You know, the, the spatial relationships between cells. Where is the immune infiltrate in reaction to the, to the um, neoplastic component? Does the tumour expand as it grows or does the tumour infiltrate as it grows? We, don't, we can see the difference. We don't tell anybody, we just keep it to ourselves as pathologists, but we, and we don't know how important it is. This data set will allow those questions to be asked, and we'll find out what's important and what's not. So I think that in the future, our reports to our clinicians will just be massively enhanced with much greater granularity. Yes, actually, I'm glad you ended that with that way because this is very much a research program today. Uh, we don't intend to, there initially to be any clinical return of kind of multimodal uh, data, and, uh, and we certainly don't want to um, get um, confronted with the turnaround time requirements to do that. But do you see in the longer term a, a clinical potential for multimodal uh, data to be used in an MDT, for example? Yeah, absolutely, completely. I mean, I think, you know, I. I think a couple of years ago, even, we would not have thought that we would do whole genome sequencing on cancer in the NHS. I mean, it would have been laughable. Um, but now it's already happening. Um, we're already doing digital pathology. So we are used to, as an MDM, we are already becoming familiar with integrating genotype with phenotype, and we have radiology in the room. So I think it's, it's totally feasible that this is going to be the, the picture of an MDM in the future. Yeah. Now, if I turn to uh, the camera for a moment and a bit, a bit of appeal to our commercial audience. Um, so we have the data. Uh, we have a platform to surface both those images and the genomes and the clinical data. Um, but what we really need um, support from industry from is an understanding of the type of questions you want to ask and the type of tools that you want us to bring into that platform to support you with your multimodal research. So we are really a genomic house. We're not an image classification um, house at all in Genomics England. And uh, so I would ask any of the pharma and biotech partners out there who are interested in doing translational research, but also basic research into cancer biology and who are interested in better understanding the spatial context to reach out to us because whilst we're capturing those images and bring them into our environment we are in parallel bringing and aggregating the tool sets required to analyze the data and matrix vectorize them into a single context that machine learning algorithms can uh, can cope with so please please do reach out to us and tell us what you need um, okay so we now have lots of questions flowing in I have to put my glasses on for this one um, okay, a question uh, both for Greg and uh, Danny. So this is about timing. So how long is this all going to take to get uh, long reads into the clinic? You might get two different answers. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll, you could I'll let Danny answer. Tell us first. what it's going to take. Like what, what, what's the Gantt chart to get us to clinical practice? <laughs> oh, no pressure. Um, <laughs> So my, my personal opinion on this is that we can get um, to a place where we can get something really tangible and useful out of this in the next 12 months. But I think uh, in order for us to 
get something commissioned and something that, that will become routine is, I, my thought is around three to four years before we really get this routine. I would love to see that accelerated and there are ways in which that may be accelerated, but that I, I tend to be more of a realist than an optimist in, in these situations. And, and when Greg says three to four years in clinical practice, that's clinically, fully clinically accredited and validated. And yeah, that's right. That, that's looking at accreditation as well for, it, it, for the process. It doesn't processes. mean that we won't have data that can influence therapy. Absolutely not. No, that, that's more in the, in the 12 months. Danny, t t tell us why he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the thing to note is that the genomic laboratory hubs are part of this project, right? We're listening to what Yes, they, what they absolutely. want now. So the question of how long it takes to get into a service is, you know, it has, it has a trajectory, but actually the involvement in, and having the NHS involved in this project to determine where to focus, where the data is going to have the most impact, we're going to see the benefits of that sooner than the timeline at which we have a commissioned accredited service. So I yeah. think it's, there's lots to learn along the way as well. Yeah. Um, Agreed with that. Um, now, th this might seem like a silly question, but I think there's quite a lot of um, uh, depth of thinking behind it. It's for you, Louise. Uh, we've had computers for a while and cameras. Why, why are we just now digitizing um, pathology? <laughs> <laughs> because pathologists are dinosaurs, right? <laughs> um, you know, we like our microscopes. Actually, seriously, there is a difference between looking down a microscope and looking on a screen. And what you have to realise is, you know, we've been trained for years to look down a microscope. So it's a retraining process and um, pathologists, I can say this, I'm allowed to say this, right? We have been resistant to this change uh, because we find it unfamiliar. But actually now the benefits outweigh the gains and most people uh, are much more computer literate. I say most, not all. Um, and, and so I think we're ready to embrace it essentially. But yeah, you're right, you know, we just, pathology takes a long time to change. Do you think, <laughs> do you think that COVID was an accelerator and, and the fact that MDTs couldn't form in person? Oh, do you know, absolutely, because um, departments were it's shipping out microscopes to people's homes, daily shipping out glass slides, which then daily got shipped back, some intact, some not. Uh, and it became so obvious that we could simply be logging online, getting our reports in, showing them to each other. What we had to do over COVID was send the slides back to the department and get it sent out to another person. Yeah, it made it all seem, you know, I think we just realised that we were a little bit kind of ancient and we needed to... <laughs> grow well, with the times. We've got to get those glass slides off the back of motorbikes because we need those motorbikes to deliver our Indian uh, curries <laughs> and Lebanese meals to our home. Um, agreed. Um, so, Greg, this is one for you. Um, the question is, any plans to include transcriptome data, chip seek data, attack seek data? Um, and if not, why not? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, the rate at which we do that is... is going to be limiting, but we, it, I assume you're talking specifically about cancer here, or are you talking about more you, you broadly? You can be expansive. So more broadly, we are at the moment running quite a large transcriptomics project where we're sequencing 6,000 undiagnosed probands to try and um, increase diagnostic yield and also generally enrich our data, our data set, and, and to give researchers the opportunity to understand the relationship between uh, mutation, particularly non-coding mutations, and transcription. We are also running an equivalent uh, proteomics study using mass spec and also using some new technologies with some commercial companies that have different approaches, looking at low abundance proteins. So uh, we, we are definitely looking at that. We're, we're very, very excited about looking at um, using Nanopore to do full length RNA sequencing because splice variants are much more easily um, established and identified using a, a full-length uh, approach. So yeah, there's, there's all sorts of things we, we would be, we have kind of lined up. Some we're already invested in and others that I know um, there are various people who are very keen to invest in. And, and we certainly are, are very interested in um, 
forming partnerships to appraise technologies, and that would be with commercial entities or with uh, GSIP collaborators, whoever. So yeah. um, we can't do everything, but we can form the kind of uh, nucleus that allows these, these kind of Yeah, I agree with that. I, if I could out. add to that, I mean, we are a Department of Health funded company. We have a, a government budget to go out and uh, d perform assays on, on um, these disease cohorts that we've talked about all day today. I, th I think you would all agree that, in fact, the government have been uh, very generous and, and f uh, insightful in, in heavily funding what yeah. is really a very world-leading program. But as you say, it, it, can't, it, it can't fund everything. Now, that, that does not mean that we can't do everything, but we need commercial partners to come in and fund those things. So partners that want to work with proteomics, with transcriptomics, we could, I got a question about cell-free DNA. Can we apply uh, Oxford nanopore sequencing, long read sequencing to cell free DNA? Um, there's a lot of talk about exosomal DNA as well. Um, these are all things that uh, we have the sample frame, the infrastructure, and the consent architecture to capture. Yeah. Uh, we need good, solid scientific uh, questions, and we need um, commercial commitment from partners to come in and explore that with us because we are set up to expand our sample framework and our, our, our assay design. We just need to work with committed partners who are asking good questions that will benefit uh, participants in, in our data set. So um, I think the answer is yes, come and work with us on these things. <laughs> with us, yeah. Or... Yes, c c come, and work, come and work with us, exactly. Um, here's a good one actually on, uh, on long reads. So we've talked quite a lot about the scientific um, benefits of understanding methylation and structural variation in cancer thanks to a new technology. Uh, but there's also a very different form factor of Oxford nanopores um, sequences and, and how will that affect um, the, the business of cancer operationally and with respect to turnaround time. Dan, Danny, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so I mean with nanopore technology it's scalable based on the amount of nanopores that you have available on your array and that's reflected in the different size of the devices that are available. So for the whole genome sequencing you go to use a promethine which can sequence up to 48 um, whole genomes at, at one time. But that also can scale back to a MinIon, that's a handheld device. So the potential is for, you know, the sequencing to be closer to a patient um, and more decentralised so that, you know, you get a faster result. The samples, is, as you were saying, Louise, aren't being, you know, shipped around all over the place. This is, you, you're able to have it much closer to the patient to get a, a faster turnaround time to result. Yeah. Um, Greg, any comment on the form factor of Oxford nanopore? Give us a sense of how big, like, could you lift one? So, uh, actually, yeah, I was going to add a comment. I mean, I think nanopore are probably better known for their field applications, or have been, in, in, because of the, the mini and the small devices that they first produced. Um, uh, and their, their whole genome sequencing devices are relatively new and um, are, yeah, about the size of a photocopier or, or a desktop printer. I mean, you. I can lift it out of the box and put it on the bench. Um, you can move them around, which is something you can't do with other instruments from other companies. Uh, but, I, but I think the, the other real advantage of, of the nanopore technology, well, actually two, and they're both related. One is you do have this kind of potential bedside application. You yeah. really can, you know, and, and I've seen um, demonstrations from labs who literally have a mini next to a, a a surgeon working and they, they literally process a sample while um, a resection is going on you know I mean it, it can be that quick I mean that's targeted sequencing but that's still the same kind of idea so so that turnaround time is 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 really can be really critical and the other thing is that, that you have that flexibility that you can you can sequence one genome um, and and on other instruments sometimes you have to pull you know, a number of genomes together to sequence them and you can't look at the data until it's all come off the machine and it's been post-processed. The great thing with nanopore is you, you really can stare at the, the, the terminal or actually get it to tell you when it's found something and you can then stop it. Sequence until. Yeah. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes left. I've got one uh, very, uh, <laughs> actually I'm glad someone asked this question because I have the same one. But then I'd, uh, so I'll ask a science question, uh, either, to, either to Greg Louise, whoever wants to take this. But then I'd like to ask just by going down the panel and saying, you know, we've talked about two different types of technology and I'd love to just end at a human level. What does this mean for patients? Uh, but for the science you want first, why is it that the Y chromosome is hard to sequence? I can answer that one if you like. Yes, please. Um, uh, because it's an inept, useless chromosome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
only possessed by males <laughs> and uh, does very little and is full of, um, I'll be polite, repetitive sequence and stuff that's not really useful to sequence. And a lot of it, the, the bits that are useful are actually very similar to the bits on the X chromosome. But, uh, okay. So there's a kind of pseudo autosomal region. So noisy and useless. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and pretty <Okay>. short. <laughs> Much smaller than you think. Yeah. And short. Yeah. It's getting worse. Okay. Um, and maybe we could go down the panel, uh, starting from you, Danny. What, what does this all mean for patients? Faster, more comprehensive results. Great answer. Louise? I think this is what precision medicine is all about, essentially. I like it. Greg? Just richer data that enables us to tackle disease in so many different ways. I think that's, that's, I hope that's what comes out of merging different technologies together, not even just nanopore, but you know, putting nanopore and alumina together at the moment is, would be really cool. A powerful combination. Mm. All right, and with that, I'd like to wrap up this panel and actually wrap up the entire day. Uh, it's been tremendously successful. I'm really glad that we did um, maintain our plan to have a, a small in-house studio audience. Thank you for all turning up. And thank you for the over 300 uh, participants that have stayed online throughout the day. We were really encouraged that you stayed there because it suggested that we were saying something of interest. We really, really hope that the uh, next um, discovery forum will be in person and we can serve you some drinks and a luxurious lunch um, and that we can network and uh, engage together and discuss both science and healthcare um, with our participants, with our academics, uh, with our commercial partners. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, we're a very open organisation, we're accessible, we'd like to take questions. I couldn't actually address all of the questions that came in today so please do send them to me, I'll make sure they get through to the right people. I'm at parker.moss at genomicsengland.co.uk and I really hope you enjoyed uh, all of the content that we've put together for you today. Thank you. <laughs>